Hello and uh, welcome to you all. Uh, it's been a few months uh, since we last met, so I'm glad to see you all here tonight. Uh, for those of you who might not know me, my name is Gavin Merrifield and I will be hosting you for this event tonight. As a gentle reintroduction to these events and because we're coming up to Christmas, well, frankly, I think we could all just do with uh, something a bit lighter and more fun in these current times. Uh, tonight we'll take a slightly different flavour to our usual events as we have some fun and try to enjoy ourselves a little bit. That said, our speaker has also promised not just fun and surprises, but some things that will leave you pondering uh, after the event finishes as well. He also promises uh, a bit of interaction, so we'll be looking for your comments and uh, opinions in the chat window or even on screen if you uh, are comfortable doing that. As ever, tonight's event has been organised by the Manchester Science and Philosophy Group, who are the local group of Christians in science here in Manchester. Our events are from a Christian perspective, but anyone from any background of an interest in the subject at hand is warmly welcomed. We are an organisation that aims to bring together and support those interested in the positive interactions between science, the church and Christian faith. To find out more about Christians in Science, go to our website at www.cis.org.uk. Uh, and if you would like to support the wider work of the organisation, then please consider whether you would like to become a member or a friend of CIS or think about perhaps affiliation for your church. Uh, details for all of these options can be found on the website. But please note that while we want your support, please don't try to substitute us for that special Christmas present a loved one has been asking for. It might not go down quite so well. Tonight's event uh, will be available on our YouTube channel afterwards, so you'll be able to re-watch it there, or greetings to you if this is uh, where you are watching it for the first time. Uh, because of that and the interactive nature of tonight, if you don't wish to appear in the recording, uh, please turn your camera off and or change your username to withhold your identity. You'll still be able to watch and engage with the rest of the evening, though. Uh, please also mute your microphones uh, if you're not actively engaged, as this just helps reduce background noise and helps us all to hear what is going on. If you forget to do this and you find yourself mysteriously muted at any point, uh, I would have done it, so please don't be offended. Uh, well, uh, some of you may be doing that. Uh, this is just a reminder that to stay up to date on future events, you can follow our local Eventbrite page where you're registered for tonight's event, or you can ask to be added to our mailing list, and the details for that are on the CIS website. But this evening, I am thrilled to be welcoming Dr. Matt Pritchard. Uh, I've got to know Matt a bit over the last few years, initially on Twitter and then via Zoom. Uh, we've even managed to meet and work together a couple of times now uh, over the last few years, uh, which does seem quite amazing given all the restrictions we are currently under. Matt describes himself in a number of ways as a science magician, a curator of wonder and a science communicator. As well as having earned a physics PhD from Durham, he is a member of the Magic Circle and brings the skills learned from there to bear on his work in public engagement. He is active in helping audiences to better understand not just science, but the experience of science and how that connects with religious faith. Recently, he has also become a leading member of the Garden the Big Bang team, visiting schools to talk about science and Christian faith. Tonight, he is going to be speaking to us on the theme of sparking wonder, leaving us with a pre-Christmas glut of ideas and inspiration rather than a glut of turkey and pudding. After Matt's show, uh, we will have a, a few minutes uh, to discuss it and to find out a bit more about Matt himself. Uh, I'm not sure how much a magician will reveal his secrets, but I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about. Our aim for tonight is to finish up around 8 p.m. So um, we will have a bit of time near the end, as I say, to uh, ask questions to Matt. So pop them into the chat window as they occur to you or write them down so you can ask them afterwards. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Matt to begin his presentation to us. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Uh, evening all. Uh, as I've you, just heard in the introduction, there's, there's really two different sides to me. And to help illustrate that, I've, I've made this. So what you'll find as we go on, I do love uh, Lego. I love playing with, with toys and I love optical illusions. And this is something I made recently. It's like a, a staircase pattern. But if we hold it this way, you can see that some of the 
the text here lines up and it makes the word science. So my background is I studied physics. I went to study atomic physics up in Durham, where I worked on uh, laser cooling, which I've now largely forgotten. The stuff that I loved about my PhD and the research was actually the, the creative communication side. And then I went on to work both in museums and now mainly with schools communicating science. So there's a science side to me, but if we turn this staircase this way, we end up with a second word, which sadly I've printed uh, back to front. So we can uh, easily rectify that with the use of a mirror. And you'll find out later, I do love using mirrors for various things. So we've got the word there, we've got the word magic, and we can just about see on the screen, we've got the two words, we've got science, and magic there. So that's the two sides of my life, really. And where those two sides intersect, uh, there's a third word, which I'll, I'll talk about later. But I love asking the, the what if question. And so this was an illusion made from printing. But I also made a, a second version. And this one here is rather than being printed, I've, I've cut out. So we've got uh, uh, different uh, cutouts again on that staircase pattern and I think you can probably work out the two words we've got here we've got the word right and if I turn it 90 degrees we've got the word left but what's really wonderful about this because it's been cut out you can shine a light through and so shining a light we end up with those two different words there or if you get two spotlights you can get that uh, double shadow you can get the left and the right and I, I, stuff like that just puts puts a big smile on my face and so so much of my work is all about this next thing so uh, a friend of mine printed this photo i normally challenge uh, children in schools to see if they can recognize this animal they only have about a second to do that and get them all screaming out the name of the animal and of course the animal's a a rabbit and so you've got the ears there and the, the eye and the, the mouth and the nose. Or if we hold it this way, maybe maybe you can see the the duck and you've got the beak and the eyes. And and it's it's a classic optical illusion that's just been photoshopped and made into a much more dynamic illusion. And I, I love that because you can view that picture in two different ways. You can get two different perspectives on that same thing and, and so much of my work is encouraging people whether that's children in school or people like yourselves this evening to view something but maybe take a fresh perspective maybe get a a, a different view a different angle on things and maybe rather than see things being an either or or a conflict maybe you can get a bigger picture by taking that view, which is one of the, the beautiful things that uh, magicians do. Magicians uh, dance with the impossible. They, they push boundaries and just encourage people to just lift their eyes up and, and look further over the horizon and see new things. So I, I mentioned the word, but I didn't tell you what it was, which I think links science and magic together. And that, I'm just gonna grab it. And this is a, uh, the word here this is the word i don't know if you can recognize it it's the word wonder and wonder has been written rather strangely it's a bit of a, a weird font here because if you turn it upside down it says exactly the same thing so what we've got here is what we call a, an ambigram an ambigram is just the name for words or symbols that you can view from a different perspective either that's upside down or or reflected in a mirror but Gavin hinted at the start that uh, tonight's going to be a little bit more interactive. And I would love your input. The, the first thing I'd love you to do, you can either unmute yourselves if you're comfortable sharing. And if you want to put your face, I'd love to see it. Or put it in the chat. Just take a moment to reflect on two questions. The, the first question is, what has recently made you go, wow? What's amazed you? What's astonished you? What's surprised you? And I'd love to hear what in the last few days has made you go, wow, made you wonder. And the second question is this, what is wonder? What does wonder mean to you? How would you, how would you define that word? So 
we're going to take a moment just to reflect and then i'd love to get some feedback from you uh, either like i said unmute yourselves or pop it in the chat and then we can share different people's uh, thoughts and experiences around this word wonder so first of all what's made you go wow and secondly what does the word wonder mean to you So at this moment, I hope people are furiously uh, tapping away on the keyboards. Oh, great. So we've got uh, Christine's first out of the blocks there. Uh, wow, the beauty of snow. Yeah, snow just totally changes the environment, doesn't it? And uh, you can look at it under under a microscope up close and the, the snowflakes are just beautiful. The, the mathematical fractal shapes, but just how it changes the scene and just also the how it changes the light levels of everything. It's uh, snow is it, snow's magical, isn't it? So thank you, Christine. Now, Peter, I can see your video. Was that something you popped up just to share something, Peter? Or did you inadvertently press the wrong button? I was working on the chat, but there we go. <laughs> oh, great. Sorry, Peter. I've got Alan Fraser saying God became man and Brian. And I think Brian, I saw you there with Ian there saying wonder is, is something beyond. Uh, yeah, I, I love that idea. Wonders that points to something beyond. We, we, we experience it in the now. Hi, Brian. Hi, Ian. Uh, we experience it in the now, but it also points to uh, there's a future. I think uh, I heard a phrase recently. I was, I was listening to an interview with uh, the magician Teller. And one of the things that came up in the chat on the Zoom box was uh, someone said, we're talking about the difference between surprise and wonder. And someone said surprise is in time. So you're having a surprise at a specific moment in time. But wonder is through time. And I, I just love that. So you get a specific moment of surprise, but wonder just goes through time. OK, let's have a look. We've also got Peter says Peter's just examined a PhD and talking about cage molecules linked into a membrane. So, yeah, I, I think it, it must be a great experience to be an examiner to actually uh, read someone's like a, what they've devoted many years of their life to and sort of pushing forward in just one specific frontier of science. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. And uh, again, Christine's commented, wonder, something suddenly becomes real to us. Yeah, and I think sometimes wonder, wonder sort of breaks into our lives, doesn't it? And it just, it, it's, it can be like a bit like a spotlight and it, it shines the light and we sometimes see clearly something that's, that's been there in front of us, but we maybe haven't been able to exactly describe or fully grasp. And I think sometimes when you have those moments of wonder, things become real to us so thank you for that keep keep thinking on that front i want to uh gavin's just shared a link just on the chat box to a uh, thing on twitter so you can uh, do that i'll have a have a look later i want to just give share with you how wonder can be in so many different areas and and to do that i'm going to share with you this is my absolute favorite number okay so i i hope you've all all our listeners have got a favorite number. This is mine. It's 6210001000. So have a look at this number. How many zeros can you see? There's a, I think there's six zeros on the screen there. And how many ones can you see? There's just two. There's, there's only one, two. There's no threes, no fours, no fives. One six right at the start, no sevens, eights, or nines. So I'm going to see if I can get this right. If we've got this here, we've got here six zeros, two ones, one two, no threes, no fours, no fives, one six, no sevens, eights, 
or nines. This is what we call an autobiographical number. It, it just describes itself on I just it's the only 10 digit number that does this. You get other numbers of different lengths, but this is the only 10 digit one. Last year, 2020 was an example of a, a four digit one that works, but uh, this is my favorite. And of course, if you're mathematical, different base systems of numbers, you can get other numbers as well. But it's my favorite number, it's just an example from mathematics. I've been fascinated with the word wonder for many years, and I've had multiple conversations with people, whether that's magicians, uh, people of faith, people who don't have faith, uh, artist explorers, and ask them really, what does wonder mean to you? And each time I ask that, I always get a slightly different answer. And, and sometimes there's a little bit of conflict there, but sometimes I see a, a, a different aspect, different perspective on wonder. And then I thought, well, actually, let's slightly formalize this. And so I started interviewing people. And over the last three, four years now, I've interviewed about 130 people. There's a whole range of people. So I've introduced, interviewed astronauts. So Helen Sharman, Britain's first astronaut. I had a chat with her about what wonder meant. I, I spoke to bishops. So the Bishop of Manchester kindly gave an interview. Con artists. So there's a, a guy, Paul Wilson, who consults for both TV and casinos in Las Vegas and around the world to stop people from cheating. All the way from astronauts, bishops, con artists to zoologists. People who climb Everest. The theologians, loads of different answers. And there was some overlap and there was some different perspectives. And, and, and tonight I want to just share some of the common themes that have come out of those interviews. And I've been trying to distill what wonder means to me personally. And I'm going to share with you what I've got so far. And it, it's interesting because it's it's really under under research, to be honest. Like if you look in psychology, often wonder gets lumped in with curiosity or it gets lumped in with awe. But I think there's more to it. So let me show you what I think wonder wonder means. So I'm going to get this uh, up on the screen here. So I'll move my head out of the way. I think there's three big aspects to wonder. I think there's curiosity. I think there's awe and I think there's play. And I think if you had all those three together, I think smack bang in the middle of that, you'll find the word wonder. So curiosity, I think we, we know when we're curious. The, almost the technical definition for curiosity is you've got an information gap. You've come across something you don't understand and you're trying to fill it. It's this drive to fill that gap in your knowledge. Or again, the technical definition for or is you've just experienced something vast, something really complex or immense, and you're trying to fit that enormity into your small head. You need to accommodate it. So that might be looking up at stars and just going, wow, it might be looking through a telescope. It might be a visit to the coast and just seeing the, the forces of nature with the, the waves smashing against the shoreline, comprehending the time that things have been weathered and eroded. And when you experience off nature, you have that moment of awe. You realise things are so much bigger than you are. And uh, you're then trying to fit that into your tiny head and I think wonder has that aspect to it. But I think wonder is also playful. I think there's a real play element. Now, when you look at children play, they, they play best in safe environments where they use your imagination, where they're, they're not told to go down a certain route. Uh, it's like I said, it's safe. It's, it's undirected. It's, it's, it's open and it's fun. And smack bang in the middle of all that, I think is wonder. So that, that's that's what I currently think wonder is. You, you may agree, you may disagree, but we can we can have a chat about that later. And things evolve over time for me. But we want some more magic, don't we? I think so. Let, let me show you. So again, I said about the what if we've got 
this this was me taking it further can you do this with not just two words can you do it with three words so what i've got here is my attempt at doing this with three words so i've got this here this is a a grid there's some uh, pyramid structure here and you can see there's some different colors now if i twist this round here we end up with the word wow so that's just one side of our pyramid if i turn it 120 degrees we end up with a second word we end up end up with the word how and if i spin it one last time we end up with this word which is now so we've got three words in one wow we've got how and we've got now and this for me this illustrates what i call the the cycle of wonder uh, that, it's nice and rhyming because it's uh, great for kids to remember you've got the wow moment the moment of surprise you've got that moment of well mm, how does it work and then you've also got the uh, the now moment what can we do with it and i think this is really important because i think often in life don't we 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 have a moment of wow surprise and then and i think a lot of us tonight we're scientists or we've we've got a very analytical way of thinking and we we almost immediately rush from the wow to the how to try and explain it and i i'm not knocking that at all but what i would like us to ponder tonight maybe we're a bit too quick to go from the wow to the how maybe by just dwelling in that what i call the liminal space between the wow and the how now if you've not heard the phrase liminal space before it's it, it sounds an awful like woo woo sort of new age or something no it's it's basically it's the end of something and the the beginning of something new but you're sort of in that gap between the two i i very much describe it as you know when you're reading a book and you get to it the end of chapter four and you you end chapter four on a bit of a cliffhanger but you haven't yet started chapter five and there's a page or two blank in the middle maybe just with the number five on it i think that's a liminal space you're in that gap that blank moment that moment of mystery between the two and i think we all need to embrace mystery a little bit more and not rush on because i think you find wonder on that knife edge between not knowing and knowing and I think the more we recognize that we don't know, the better for us and the better for our sense of wonder. How's great. I, I love uh, uh, Richard Feynman, the, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, talked about how he can appreciate the beauty of a flower. He can have the wow, the aesthetic beauty. But by understanding a bit about the biology, how the, the flower has been shaped, how the colours have been uh, e evolved to be that way, how the scent there, how it attracts insects to pollinate with other flowers. By understanding the how a bit more, it doesn't strip the wow, it builds up and you get an extra layer of wow to it. But if we stop there, we miss out on something. A how isn't meant to be a full stop, it's meant to be a springboard. It's meant to be a springboard to asking now, what could we do with this? Now I wonder what would happen. And that's why I include that now. It's that imagining, it's that questioning, it's that uh, moving forward step. And that then leads to more wows, hows and nows. And I think sometimes for those of us listening uh, with, with a faith, I think sometimes sometimes we like to cling to certainty but actually life is life is full of doubts and unknowns and sometimes we feel well we need to be to have our faith we need to be certain we need to know what's happening and i think for me probably one of the best definitions of faith is it's just picture this for a moment i want you to picture your driving across a big suspension bridge across a river like if you know what the golden gate bridge in san francisco looks like that's the perfect example and you you often get these suspension bridges you get clouds obscuring your view and you can't see through the cloud and so really as the driver of a car going across this bridge you can't see through the cloud 
what are you going to do? Are you going to safely stop the car or are you going to keep on going? I think probably most people would keep on going, wouldn't they? Even though you can't see, even though there's mystery ahead. Because when you look at the bridge, you go, well, the bridge looks pretty safe. And you think, well, the bridge has been here for years and, and maybe you see some other drivers around and that gives you confidence. And, and maybe you look behind you and realise that the bridge has gone in a straight line and has kept you safe so far. And then probably by moving forward, it'll still be in a straight line. But I think the important thing about cloud is when you go into a cloud, you can't see through it, but you can see a little bit in front of you, can't you? And then when you go into that, you can see a little bit in front of you. Faith for me is not the absence of doubt. It's the presence of action. I'll say that again. Faith is not the absence of doubt. It's the, the presence of action. Whether you're a person of faith or whether you're a scientist, I think the same applies. Scientists, we have to have faith in what we're doing and we never fully have certainty in what we're doing. And experiments are basically the presence of action, even though we've got a bit of doubt about what's going to happen next. And, and as we do that, we learn and we sort of get a better idea of what the world's like. And I think faith is very similar to that. It's not a leap of faith. It's a step forward. It's a, a slow moving forward. So just, again, something else for you to ponder. I want to show you a video. In this video, Really, I think it illustrates this, this idea of wow, how, and now. What you'll find in the video, you'll see it three times. The first time, I just want you to look at the, the mirror's reflection. And something odd will happen. But then you'll be curious and you want to know how it works. So the second time you'll see it, you'll see the front view and you'll get to have the privileged side view, the backstage view you can see what's happening behind the scenes. But then it happens quick. So the third time, I'm going to slow it down for you. So you get to really see what's happening. And then maybe you'll start to ask some now questions. So here we go. The cause of question is where did, where did that extra building block come from? So let's again, like I said, get the side view. And then let's slow it down because that was quick. So what you've just experienced is what we call a self-assembling net. I think some of you may have memories way back in primary school in your math lessons where you took a flat piece of paper and folded it up and made a cube or a different, uh, different shape like that. And that's just that. Two strings pulling the sides could fold up. And I just spent a bit of time camouflaging it on the flat surface first and then positioning the mirror and the cube just so it appeared at the right spot. So that was taking something flat and making something 3D. Engineers at NASA have took a, almost the reverse approach. And they asked, they saw something quite amazing. And then they asked, well, now what could we do with it? So what I've got here is a origami shape. So let's get a bit of a close up view on this. So we've got this shape here. This is, it looks a bit like a rose. If I was to take opposite corners, or office, opposite sides of this rose and pull, you'll see it opens up into, if I was to, I could flatten this out and then it will coil back up so you can unroll it. And it's a lovely moment where it does that. So you can make something quite compact and you can open it into a nice flat shape. And so engineers at NASA looked at this and thought, I could use this. Because the problem we've got is we've got satellites in space and they've got really big solar panels. And how do you get big solar panels into space? Well, you build, build big rockets or maybe you fold the solar panels up. And so they are designing satellites with solar panels and also now telescopes with mirrors 
that are folded up with patterns like this. And so they can be very tightly, compactly folded. They can sit inside the payload of a rocket, launch up when it gets into a space. A very simple mechanism, almost like a spring release mechanism will unfold this and you've got a giant surface area in space folded really nicely. And I, I just love that idea. You look at something, you go, wow, you get an understanding of how, and then you go, well, now what could we do with that? Just, just while I'm showing you uh, shapes I really love. This is, this is another shape. This is a, a favorite of mine. I need to zoom back. And it, uh, to be honest, the only reason I'm zooming back is I just want you to appreciate my Christmas jumper. So uh, here we go. Well, let's just have a quick view of that. Look, isn't that, isn't that just wonderful? There we go. Okay. Now, this is a six-sided shape. So here we go. Ta-da! And I know where you're going. It's like, Matt, this is just a hexagon. It's, no, no, no. This is not just a hexagon. This is a yellow hexagon. And it's not just a yellow hexagon. It's also a blue hexagon. Told you, this, this is just wonder in itself here, right? But of course, if we're again back in primary school, we're doing colour mixing. Yellow and blue mixed together makes green. And so we've now got three colours. We've got a yellow, a blue, a green. I haven't told you about the red colour, though. So we've got red now and red and yellow mixed together makes orange. So that's colour five. And there's, there's one last one. I wonder if you can predict what it's going to be. So we've got blue and red, blue and red mixed together makes purple. And so we've got this, this lovely shape. It's, it's given a ridiculous name. Some of you will recognise it, but this is called a hexa hexa flexagon. It's a, it's a hexagon, and so it's got the first hexa. It's got six colours, so it's got another hexa, and it flexes and it folds. And it's, like I said, one of my favourite shapes to uh, play around with. It's, I, I love recreational maths because it just, A, it's playful, but B, often it leads to really interesting discoveries. In fact, uh, I mentioned earlier Richard Feynman, the physicist. He was one of the people who investigated this when they first came about during his time as a graduate student and some of you who know your particle physics will know that Feynman's responsible for Feynman diagrams and I don't think it's a coincidence that the guy who looked at the patterns and the folding and the mapping of this uh, paper model then came up with different ways of mapping particle interactions so I think sometimes Sometimes recreation and fun can translate itself into real life. So I want to share with you now two, uh, two big thoughts that have come out of those interviews I've been conducting with people. And the first one's really quite simple, and that's to slow down. Life, life is so busy and it's so noisy and it's so fast paced and we constantly get the pings and the notifications of smartphones and emails. And that's not great for a sense of wonder. We need that time and space to allow ideas to percolate, to form, to connect together. And I, I'm just going to share you some examples from nature where slowing down has really made me go wow so the first one is if you've if you've got if you've got a, a smartphone you have got in your hands a wonderful tool to investigate nature so the first thing i'm going to suggest you do go into your camera mode and go on to time lapse mode and that basically means you can do all those smart bits of video that you see in all the nature films. So what I've got here is this is just some plants on my windowsill and it's been filmed over 90 minutes. And as the sun moves around, you can see how the leaves are tracking the sun. And I, I just think this is fantastic. You don't expect plants to move. And yet you can see them slowly moving over the sun with just the aid of just a camera, something you've probably got on your desk or in your pocket right now. So that's that's one thing you can do. Another example of slowing things down is this. This is a great battle between engineering and nature. So this is one of my local parks. I live in Birmingham. This is quite close to the Birmingham University in Harbon. 
And you can see that at some point, a tree has been planted next to a, a fence or the fence has been erected next to a tree. And as the tree has grown and got bigger, the forces have bent one of the bars of that uh, tree, of that fence. But the thing I love the most is the two other bars have been swallowed up by the tree. The tree has effectively grown through the fence. And if you were to cut the tree down right now, you'd find two metal bars running through it. You can see the scar marks. And there's some lovely examples. Next time you walk along somewhere where there's an old fence and a tree, have a look, because often the tree will grow through a fence. There's a somewhere at the bottom of my uh, road, there's a park and there's a, a chain link fence and the tree has literally grown through the chain link fence. And you can see that sort of diamond pattern on the tree's trunk, which is just blows my mind that it's done that. Maybe over the course of 50, 70 years, it's done that. So slow down. And just just because I love this video so much, I want to show you. Let's see if I can find this. Have I got this with me? Ah, Yes, there we go. This was taken over the summer and I was so fortunate to be there just at the moment. This baby woodpecker had fledged. And so I'm about a metre or two away from this woodpecker. Just there's a cycle path right where I'm stood and it's there. And it's just like a wonderful wow moment of just go creation. So, so amazing. And you don't think about the foxes that might gobble it up afterwards. But what's interesting about this, loads of my friends have said, Matt, you were so lucky to see that. And yeah, there's there is an element of luck. But I've been walking that path for many weeks. I, uh, some of you may know, I'm uh, at times our family are foster carers, and I was had a baby in our care at the time, and I used to walk back and forth on that path at the end of the day, just basically to give everyone a bit of a respite from uh, uh, the noise of a baby, and to get out in nature during the pandemic. And I knew there was a tree, and I knew there was a nest in it, and I suspected there was woodpeckers. So each time I walked along, I would be looking up. I'd be expectant to see something. And then I started hearing the noises of baby woodpeckers in the nest. And so I kept on doing that same path again and again, treading the same ground, kept on looking and noticing. And then one day happened to be there at the right time. So, it, yeah, it was luck. But also I was approaching it with an expectancy. And so... The second thing I really want to share with you from the interviews is this word here, Vushar Day. Now, at this point, some of you are probably thinking, Matt, you've got this wrong. It's deja vu. Deja vu is when you experience something that you feel like you've already experienced. Vushar Day is experiencing the extraordinary in the ordinary. So you something every day you suddenly see a different part to it. It's like seeing the magical in the mundane. And, and you do that. You do that. Like I said, with being intentional, expecting to see things. I, I love the quote from Roald Dahl, the children's author. He says, it's, it's a quote you've probably seen before. And above all, watch with glittering eyes the whole world around you because the greatest secrets are always hidden in the most unlikely places. Those who don't believe in magic will, will never find it. And I think sometimes the most unlikely places are just under your nose. I think we, we sometimes become experienced tourists. We, we go off to have an adventure, whereas actually sometimes it's there right under our noses and we just need to follow what we see. We're in a season now of Advent thinking forward to the birth of Jesus and and one of the things that I was reminded of earlier today is the story of the magi who or the wise men from the east they they're astronomers they're wise men they they studied and they saw a strange star and they followed that and that led them on an adventure they were expectant and they didn't fully understand what was going on 
there was some doubts, but they still had that presence of action and they they went on an adventure following that star and led them to quite an amazing encounter. Sometimes we just need to follow that little little star in front of us and see where that that leads us. Right. On that note, something completely different. So I want to share with you a tiny little adventure I've been on this last probably three years now. And it involves an everyday object, it involves a can of drink. And I want to show you something fun you can do with this. So let's get the camera up. So what we've got here, I just need to tilt it up a bit. If you take a can of drink and you tip it to one side, this will work. There we go. You can get it balancing at this, this rather precarious angle. And, and some people, when they see this, they go, oh, Matt, you've got like a magnet under the table or there's, there's glue and stuff. No, it's just balancing. It, it won't work if you've got a, a full can of drink will tip over. And if you've got an empty can of drink, that will that will also tip over. It needs to be half full with liquid. So you can imagine what's happening inside. So I've got my drinks bottle here, half full. The liquid sloshes around when it's like this you've got roughly half the weight this side half the weight this side or half the force this side half the force and that's balanced and when you can do that you can have fun so i've got it half full with uh, water and we've got something that we can balance but we can also do this if you have a bottle lid that's concave it bends down you can balance your can on top of the lid of the bottle and that looks more impressive it's actually easier because that that concave lid like a bowl it self centers it doesn't roll off the side it just it just stays there so that that's one thing you can do have fun balancing things i went to a, a science museum and I, I i picked up this this is a a pterosaur and what's special about this is it's been designed to balance on my finger or my thumb like this or if you want you can put it on the lid of a bottle and it'll balance really nicely it's, and you can spin it around it's, it's pretty stable the way it's been designed i'll just show you here you've got obviously it's symmetrical so you've got half and half this way so it's balanced that way it looks like there's way more weight at the back end but there's actually two hidden weights at the uh, the tips here where the, the sort of the hands of the terrace or whatever you call them. And so there's like little metal washers in there and that counterbalances it. Cost me 15 quid though. And I think 15 quid for a piece of plastic with two washers is a rip off. And so I want to show you a way you can make it for free. This may be an activity you can do Christmas afternoon. You've opened your presents. You've got you've just had your dinner. So you've got some uh, forks left over. You've also had your, your bottle of Prosecco. And so you've got uh, a little uh, drinks cork there. And maybe you've got a matchstick or a cocktail stick. So that's, that's all you need to make this. So let me show you. So we have got, first of all, we've got our drinks cork. And I've just stuck the matchstick in there. That's going to be the beak. Then you stick one fork in here. That's one. And the other side, again, going for symmetry, you've got two. And so you've got this reproduction of your pterosaur. It didn't cost you anything. This will balance really nicely on the lid of a bottle or on your finger. And again, if we look down from the top, we've got this left to right symmetry. The extra weight on the end of the forks there are the counterbalance. That's all right. But we, we can take this further. So something I realized was, I'll show you with my can here. So I've got a little matchstick that I've glued to the side there. And the position of the matchstick is very important because it's just there. If you look, that matchstick is directly above the bottle lid, which means if I was to push on the top there, I'll be pushing straight down through the bottle to the table, to the floor, nothing will happen. If I push on the left here, it will tip this way. If I push on the right, it will tip that way. Which means, in principle, I can land this pterosaur 
onto that matchstick. So I'm going to have a go at doing this. It might work, it might not, but we might be able to get a double balance going on here. There we go. So now we've got a can that's balanced at the bottom, just on the bottle. And we've also got the beak of the flying fork flyer just resting on that ledge. So there's no, no other contact, it's just on that edge there. And you've got a double balance. But I don't think, I don't think two balances is enough for you this evening. Shall we go for a third? Yeah, I can see some nods. Great, let's go for a third. So this is the only thing that I've bought specially in. So this, some of you may recognize, this is uh, the type of thing people buy if they want to show off at a dinner party. Do, do, we, do we remember dinner parties? It's when we had friends and they sort of came over and ate and drank together. But what would happen is you get a wine bottle and you'd stick it in this hole here and your wine bottle would be balanced at a rather precarious angle. So... I want to show you this. So I first of all, I tried this with a bottle of wine. I can see Brian and Ian on, on brand there, sort of topping up as well. Great stuff. Wine bottles don't work. I discovered to my cost, I'm actually banned from doing this in my kitchen because I first used a red wine bottle and, and Sarah, my wife, told me in no uncertain terms not to do any more experimenting in the kitchen with the wine. So I'm going to use a bottle of olive oil, a square bottle. And this will help me with this. So we'll get this camera down a bit. There we go. So we've got this structure. It's, it's too heavy at this end. So I'm going to counterbalance it here. Okay. And so we've got a structure which looks like it should collapse. But it's just a seesaw. It's just half the force this side, half the force this side, and it, it stays up. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Because I can put something on that bottle lid. So I'm going to see if I can balance the can on the bottle lid like this. Now, to give myself a, uh, a fighting chance, I'm just going to introduce these are like little uh, safety nets. They're going to go under here. I will remove them at the end. It's just if it gets knocked as I build it, it's got me, give me a chance not to spill water everywhere. The other thing is a little spirit level. I discovered to my cost, I did this at the magic circle and the stage is like really tilted and I couldn't balance it. So I now use a spirit level just to get everything nice and horizontal. And I think we're good to go. Move the camera back again so we can get this view. Need to stand up for this. Right. Looking good. Let's see if we can take away the support. There we go. So now we've got a, a double balance. We've got a balance at the bottom. We've got a balance there. Three balances. Should we put this on as well? Add that to the proceedings. So again, I'm just going to Put my safety nets back in. This is where my hands start to shake. We'll see if we can do this. Okay, looking good. Oh, uh oh. There we go. We've now got a triple balance going on, but we've still got a pterosaur. So I'm going to see if I can add that. And this is, this is where it, I always take things too far, but we'll, we'll give it a go. There we go. We've now got a quadruple balance. I'll give you a little tour. We've got the bottom there. We've got the pterosaur just peeking its beak on the edge. We've got the, the can there, and of course we've got the flying pterosaur, and we get this very strange looking uh, sculpture going on. So I'm going to very quickly diffuse this before it collapses on me. I just want to show you something that I managed to do. This, is, this next thing took me 
literally three hours to get to work. But I did manage, if I can find the right video, to right under my nose. There we go. This is a four cans balanced. And I use little bottle lids just to be those platforms. And you can get that lovely, lovely little sculpture there going on. So I think that's probably a good point for me just to stop rabbiting on. I'd love to get your thoughts and questions. I'm going to hand back just to um, Gavin to help uh, uh, help facilitate this. So feel free to put some questions in the chat, some discussion. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and love to hear your thoughts and comments on some of the stuff we've gone over tonight, Gavin. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that, Matt. Uh, great always to be reminded of uh, the need, I think, to slow down and appreciate the Vuja Day, as you call it, uh, all around us. Uh, though I still find the idea of uh, recreational mass uh, a little bit suspect. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, so, yeah, as Matt was saying, if you have any questions, uh, do you want to pop them in the chat or raise your hand uh, using the appropriate reaction button uh, if you're brave enough to uh, come on the screen with your question? Uh, but just to get us going while you're thinking of your own questions, uh, just want to ask Matt to tell us a little bit about the, the kind of work he does in the kind of the science and religion field of God and the Big Bang and uh, other things. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me uh, see if I can uh, spotlight us. Uh, yeah, there we go. Great stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I work part time for an organisation called God and the Big Bang, who very much actually came out of the Manchester Diocese. And the idea is often I think the science faith debate is tends to be quite an, a negative conflict, apologetic style uh, discussion. And often we try and beat the other side with our, with our clever arguments. And what God and the Big Bang is trying to do is work with schools to show uh, this positive interaction between science and faith, how the two can work together, how if you're a scientist and you've got faith, it can, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it can enhance your work, both in the lab, in the field, but also outside of that. And, and, and vice versa as well. And we do that by bringing in a, a host of different speakers on a, a variety of topics. And they all talk about their life, their research, and just really uh, giving the students a chance to reflect on different areas where science and faith might overlap in, in a positive way. And, and often, sometimes it's just powerful to bring in someone of faith who is also a scientist we we almost become walking paradoxes to many students because they think you can't be both at the same time and so we go in there we have some good discussion and uh, sort of hear uh, hear the students thoughts as well and at the end of the the day spent with the students they ask us a load of questions and we usually have a really lively question and answer uh, session ranging from questions like uh, do aliens exist which then leads on to well if aliens exist did Jesus have to visit all the other planets or do they have their own gods questions about well if God made the world did he make earthquakes and did he then make something that causes pain and suffering and and some really tricky questions like that and then other questions about uh, what's the hottest planet in the solar system so just a real mix yeah, brilliant sounds like great work um so how, how does your kind of your interest in wonder and awe affect your own personal faith i think i think it makes it bigger i think every time i feel like yeah i've got a nice neat answer suddenly i realize oh no i'm just at the end of this chapter and there's something new to discover in the next chapter so there's that i think it uh helps me to be more comfortable with uncertainty and ambiguity much as that can be tough at times how would you kind of encourage someone who wanted to kind of uh, engage in this kind of way talking uh, less about like you say the defensive apologetic side of science and faith and more about kind of wonder what, what kind of practical tips can you can you give them i, I think first of all 
I think when you when you approach a conversation with the intent to listen to what the other person has to say and their thoughts, I think uh, often we can approach people knowing that we've got an agenda and we want to we want to impart loads of information and we want them to change their way of thinking. I think when you do that, people naturally either shut down or it puts their backs up and they start uh, pushing back. Whereas actually, if you come in there genuinely wanting to listen and find out what people think and be curious about their own thoughts, often that's reciprocated and they will be curious about you as well because you've shown them respect. And I think that's, uh, that's a really top tip of just going in there to listen rather than speak. There's still a few minutes if uh, anyone has any other questions, uh, but I'll just keep going with mine in the meantime, if not. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what brought you into the kind of thinking about wonder and, and awe um, yourself? I think some of it came about because, like I said, my two parallel strands with science and magic, I, I was fairly dissatisfied actually with both. Uh, for someone whose life as a magician is all about enchantment, uh, I was getting very disenchanted with it. And I felt sometimes when you're doing science communication, you suddenly go, you've shown you something amazing, then ta-da, here's how it works, end of story. And uh, also with magic, it's like, okay, I'm surprising people and showing them something they've not seen before, but, but so what really? Uh, I love the the quote by uh, this uh, someone I interviewed Vincent Gambini. He talks about magic being philosophy in action. They're almost visual parables as well, magic, and it 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 raises people's thinking. And I think for me, the, the middle ground, the overlap, the way forward for for both those areas of my life was exploring the idea of wonder, of trying to uh, share more rather than impress people, rather than uh, uh, impart knowledge, was to, okay, I've got this amazing thing that I've discovered. Hey, come come next to me, and uh, we can join in and explore it together. I'm very much like a facilitator or a guide, rather than, uh, rather than the performer. I was just thinking about um, Jesus's parables and kind of like storytelling with a twist. Uh, just as you were saying about kind of visual parable parables there uh, so yeah, yeah there's a lot, lot of resonances there and with so many of jesus's stories and parables and teachings there's there's no real easy answer is there and um, you can you sometimes get the sunday school answer and you go jesus said this so that uh but actually you look at any of it like the sermon on the mount which is in uh, matthew's gospel there's a few chapters quite early on some of that, if you really start unpacking, it's completely mind blowing. Some of the stuff he's talking about and the, the, the paradoxes uh, within his teaching that we we have to wrestle with or hold those tensions uh, together. Yeah, yeah. I think I think there'll always be a, a place for a good talk and for good Q and A, but approaches I think like you're taking out we've seen tonight. Um, highlighting that sense of wonder are really needed as well. We can reach new audiences that maybe are kind of more traditional formats, kind of like we might enjoy them, but maybe they don't, they're not as effective at reaching people that we don't normally speak to, who we need to be speaking to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've just uh, noticed that the time is actually on nine o'clock. Uh, so we need to draw things to a close. Uh, so thank you to uh, Matt for speaking oh, thank to us. Thank you, Gary. Uh, um, providing us with uh, both fun and some food for thought uh, and hopefully we'll be carrying a bit over uh, into a holiday time uh, you certainly have a few interesting tricks to show people at the Christmas dinner table uh, so thank you all for joining us uh, tonight just to say our next event is on January the 27th next year uh, at 7 30 p.m so put it in your diaries now uh, where we'll be welcoming Dr Neville Cobb who will speak to us on chance and necessity. Uh, Neville is a fruit fly geneticist by scientific background, but is currently training for the ministry with the Church of Ireland. 
so it is sure to bring us some interesting perspectives on the topic. Uh, but just a note to say that given the ongoing situation with COVID and now Omicron, uh, we will be continuing to hold our events online until further notice. We had hoped to be meeting in person by now, but uh, sadly that's not uh, a safe thing to be doing at the moment. But hopefully by the summer uh, we'll be able to meet again uh, in person. So thank you again to Matt and thank you all for joining us. And just to finish by wishing you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year for 2022. And until next month, uh, keep well and keep safe. Good night.